Hi, and welcome to F-World, the Fragility Podcast. Together with our guests, we explore how the force of fragility manifests across the world and in our day-to-day lives, and how we can build a more resilient future. I am joined by my two co-hosts, Paul Beska and Johan Bjurman Bergman. And today we're speaking with Alexander Mark. Alexander is a political scientist and economist. He's also an associate fellow at the uh, International Institute for Security Studies and a member of the Institute for Integrated Transitions. He was previously affiliated with the Brookings Institution. Alexander brings over 30 years of experience working in areas of conflict and fragility across four continents. He was the chief specialist for fragility, conflict and violence at the World Bank, and he's the lead author of the UN World Bank flagship report, Pathways for Peace, Inclusive Approaches to Preventing Violent Conflicts. He also co-led the preparation of the World Bank for a strategy on addressing fragility, conflict, and violence. And he has extensive experience in areas of conflict, fragility, having worked across all related themes over the last 32 years. He had joined the bank in 1988 in the Africa region. Alexander, welcome to f World. Welcome. Welcome to all. So we first like to ask our guests a very, very similar question across all of our conversations. We want to learn your story, how you became interested in fragility and conflict. So can you tell us a bit about yourself, where you grew up, the people, places and ideas that led you on this path? You know, it's a, it, it's a very logical story, I think. I grew up in the center of Paris, but I grew up in a family that was uh, fascinating, fascinated with traveling and, and discovering different culture. So I was very, very lucky. My mother was Russian, my father was French, and they were looking in understanding symbolism in architecture, which is a, an unusual thing at that time. So they were always taking time you know, when I could also, when I was very small and hitting the road, but not as the standard tourist. They would be living in monasteries. We would be staying in archaeological center. We would go all over the world. And with this, I uh, started by, you know, going at four years old in Egypt and then uh, staying with the archaeological mission there for some time. And then I started... Uh, we we did we crossed Afghanistan by car. We went from Paris to uh, to Jordan uh, by car. Also, uh, we crossed I- Iran by car at a time where it was not so easy, and uh, all sorts of uh, I would say adventure of this kind. This made me actually extremely interested in other cultures. And, uh, and to understand how other cultures, uh, which at that time were even more different than they are from each other than they are now, uh, I wanted from the very beginning to make that my profession, try to understand how culture can come together. When, when you look at how different culture, how different minority group can live together, There's no other way, unfortunately, than to try to understand conflict because all that goes uh, with conflict. So I actually didn't start immediately on conflict. Uh, I did a thesis on the political economy of Cameroon for my PhD, but looking already about how different groups inside the the country were actually uh, behaving between each other. I remember I did... uh, I did a model which I think was the most interesting in my thesis was the relation between the price of banana and witchcraft. So it was already, you see, the the, the connection between uh, anthropology and economics. And then I moved into the World Bank to do what, uh, what I'm doing now also, which is studying conflict and how minority groups can live together. So can you actually, first of all, I think we should make a movie of your life. I think every single one of us wanted to have your childhood and, or even in adulthood, if we could do that. And second, what is the relationship between banana trade and witchcraft? 
Well, it's it's a, an interesting. It's a heart, at the heart of what I'm really interested in is the behavior of why people behave in certain ways and why be, people behave uh, sometimes in ways that are very bizarre. So you had huge plantation of banana at that time in the the Cameroon. That was the sort of the the what is called now the British Cameroon, the English speaking Cameroon. It was always a land of big plantation and. At that time, they had switched to banana. But it was a period that was just uh, between the two, the two world war where the prices were fluctuating a lot. All those prices of agriculture uh, were fluctu flu fluctuating a lot. And that was creating huge stress on the plantations because when the price would be falling, workers will be fired and there will be no more price. A plantation would be abandoned for two or three years until the prices would go up again. And so there was a huge stress. And how did people uh, relate to this stress was by starting to believe that there was actually zombies that were coming back from the Mount Cameroon and taking their soul and taking them to work on the Mount Cameroon for other plantation that was in another type of life. And this was very, what was very interesting is that, that uh, the Cameroon at that time was under the Society of Nation uh, management, uh, which means that they, there was a lot of reporting. And the re there were a lot of reporting on prices, and there was a lot of reporting on incidents of witchcraft. So you started to correlate to the two. Nobody had thought about that before. And it gave you a really interesting description of the dynamic. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting you, you say that because sometimes to try to understand how inflation is managed, it can seem a bit like witchcraft, uh, except done by, by certain people in suits. It's interesting when you mentioned your, your travels with your parents that you, know, you would look at symbolism in, in architecture. That is an extraordinary exercise in observation. Uh, in learning to notice and try and trying to to link um, what is obvious, you know, a building or something, with what is deeper in a way, the psychological aspects and so on. And I wanted to ask you, um, how do you travel in generally? You know, uh, how do you uh, professionally? You had to travel for to, to fragile states. You had to work with these countries. What about that experience taught you to see the world in a different way? So, you know, when I was at the World Bank, I was always famous for, on my mission, uh, to say, you know, we work very hard on the mission, but we have one day where we only do the culture, whatever is the objective of the mission. It can be, you know, to set up a monitoring system on conflict. It can be to build up a fund for financing small infrastructure, like we did in, uh, in Armenia after a conflict. But you will, we will all go and organize with our counterpart, usually the Sunday, a visit to the places or the people or the markets where there was really interesting things happening, representing the culture of the country. And that was a rule. Actually, I've heard from some consultant that they really like to go on mission for me because they had this one day where you could go and do the, the cultural stuff. And I was trying to say when they would say, oh, there's too much work and all that, I would say, okay, work more because, you know, Sunday is the culture day. You're not going to go and work on Sunday or maybe you'll do when you go back to the hotel, but you have to do that. That's part of the way you're going to understand this country. No, I think I think that's that that is a really interesting and, and important view. And so, what would you say then, in in just building on Paul's question, when you have a country that is that is fragile, where it's maybe challenging to to go out among peoples, where there's uh, suspicion or distrust, uh, especially when when a person who looks like me or you uh, arrives there, how do you go about building that trust that allows you to make those discoveries and understand that culture uh, on, on a deeper level? 
Um, so, you know, even if you do a very technocratic mission, you have to prepare it. And fortunately, in the field of conflict, you don't have other way than to try to understand the culture, to try to understand the politics, what has happened before. So I always myself, but pushed all my team to invest quite heavily into those type of readings when I was going first time in a country and then to improve on it. Uh, and that gave birth, I think, to uh, an analysis that we developed in the bank, which is the, the fragility analysis, right? That tried to bring all those elements of culture and all that in there. So wh what you need to do is to have this understanding. And then from your first meeting, you start to make some references. And people, people are just not used to see a, a bureaucrat coming in and starting to talk to them about this church of the 15th century or about uh, these episodes in their history a long time ago. And they become immediately very intrigued and usually extremely happy, especially from a World Bank or an IMF mission, because this is not the type of things you, you expect, right? And, and, and that was very often a, a great entry point into anything. And people believe because, you know, I being genuinely interested in those things and having team, recruiting team that are genuinely interested, I think people feel it very quickly that you are not just there to do the, the numbers and the things. You're there because you actually like those people. And also most of those cult culture, which is really interesting, we tend not to, you know, to feel that that's a lose of time. If you come in the United States and go somewhere and start to talk about, you know, the culture of the place, I think people might think is displaced. But it's not at all in most of the country you work in. You know, you go to Central African Republic where people usually don't know anything and you start to talk about the past, about what happened when the French were there, about certain, you know, how did the group in the Muslims know? And then people look at you and say, oh, this person knows something about us and they start to discuss it and, and be much immediately much, much more open and also much more open to go and open up to what they see on the true dimension of the conflict that they might not tell someone else. I had a question then, as you were talking about the, the places, the people and the different conflicts, what is conflict? And how do we how do we think about it? How how should we conceptualize it? And I'm asking now, both from your experience as a professional, but also from your life experience and all of that rich experience uh, that you just described. Very good question. I will start with a little anecdote. When we were writing the Pathway for Peace, that was a huge endeavor. As you know, there were more than 70 researchers working on it, uh, about 40 institutions involved, uh, the UN management, the World Bank management. You can imagine what, what it means. We started to have a conflict on the word conflict. And that was at the end of the report, where suddenly an advisor of the UN took the report and said, but wait conflict, violent conflict, this, this does not exist in the legal framework of the UN. What you have in the legal framework of the UN is armed conflict. So you have to talk about armed conflict. You cannot talk about conflict, it's armed conflict. So I went back to the chief economist of the World Bank uh, and I told him that and he said, I, I, I'm sorry, but that does not go. As, as economists, conflict is very important. Conflict is exactly what people have to do so that they know what's the position of another. What you don't want is the conflict to go into being a violent conflict. But if you don't have the conflict and all the points on the table about the conflict, the conflict for sure will turn violent because you will not be able to know what are the type of issues that are really at stake. That was a huge issue. Uh, you know, this advisor of the UN, which I would not say the name, took the automatic uh, uh, spell checking and, and, and erases all the word conflict throughout the report to replace them by armed conflict. 
which means that even in the bibliography, when there was a book that was called Conflict Somewhere, it became Armed Conflict. But anyway, we're not going to talk too much about that, but this is the type of, of issue. So in, in two words, conflict are very important. Conflict are part of humanity. That's in conflict that all what is, is like the human psychology, all what is hidden in yourself come out. But what you want is manage the conflict so that it does not become violent. And some people will tell you, well, unfortunately, sometimes violent conflicts are even necessary because when the abscess is too, too big, you need to have some form of violence. I don't believe in that. I believe that you need to have this result by different means. But conflict and violent conflict are two different things. Conflict can be very positive. Violent conflict is the thing you want to avoid. And does conflict, the way we resolve conflict as people, because even in our families, we have to have conflict in order to actually resolve our, our differences. But the way we argue, let's say, or debate or enter a conflictual situation, how does that vary from your experience across cultures? And does that then have an impact in how you take action to prevent it from getting to the violence part? So it's, it, it is very, very uh, complicated. That's one of the most difficult thing, I think. Because very often, like in a family, you believe that the conflict inside the family are not worth being discussed outside of the family. That's actually something that is very private. But, you know, if you don't go to a psychoanalyst or now I'm doing propaganda for my parents' work, but uh, to, uh, to a, someone to help, you're not going to be able to resolve this conflict. And when you arrive as the World Bank or as the UN in a country, the first people will want to tell you, yeah, yeah, there's been an incident, but there's no conflict. We understand those people very well. We understand their problems. And that is, becomes very, very difficult because you start, you have to start to tell them that, well, no, you know, there are problems. Let's try to resolve them. A lot of those problems are actually economic and social. So this is really the ground of the World Bank uh, because they first tell you, no, the World Bank should not go into that. That's for the UN. I say, sorry, you know, most of your people there are unhappy about land distribution. The UN will not deal with your, your land distribution. This is, a U, this is a World Bank thing. So that's one of the most difficult is to try to make uh, a, a nation, uh, a government, try to accept that it's okay, that conflicts are everywhere. And very often when we talk with them, I take example from France, from the United States and all that, because if not, they feel very quickly that being in conflict means that you are really underdeveloped and therefore you want to hide it. It's exactly like human psychology. And, and so I want to hide it to be like the others. But yes, but you know, the others actually are like you they maybe have more powerful institutions to manage them, but there's a lot of conflict there too. So in discussing with the countries, I always try to take examples from developed countries and says, you know, I say, you know, we have a conflict in Corsica, you know, how we are trying to deal with it. That's a complex. And you see to, uh, the, the person of Central African Republic said, ah, yes, I've heard. So how, what, what did you do in Corsica with the people of the island? Because we have the people in the north also. It's a very, very different dynamic than if you arrive and says, you know, you're fragile and that means you have a lot of conflict. So let's start to work on your case. Alexander, you foreshadowed in a way the, the two questions I wanted to, to ask you and they're very much related. The first is you made the distinction between conflict and, and violent conflict and the Pathways for Peace report that, that you led opens with an overview of, of the most important trends. And quickly, first quickly, if you can tell us, what are those trends that you believe every curious person in the world should know? And then my second question is how, you mentioned the role of the bank and the role of the UN. Why did they decide to write a report about this? Why was this so important? So, well, the two questions are totally connected, right? Because the thing that happened is that conflict have increased quite a lot uh, a few years after the, the Cold War. 
So you had many reasons for that. But what you had is you had a sort of, you had some terrible conflict between the Cold War, right? You had the Vietnam War, you had conflict in Latin America. But somehow they were, they were more, uh, maybe more managed than what happened after. And then after the Cold War, you had a period where because suddenly Soviet, the, the former Soviet Union d- didn't care much and the US didn't care much, where you had a sort of uh, increase in conflict, you know, in Rwanda and Burundi in different places, and also the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union itself and the, the, the Eastern Bloc also created the Yugoslavia conflict. But after that, you had a period of incredible peace, uh, you know, for, for about five, six, seven years. And then you had the terrorist event and, and, and things like that that came in some from two, 2000, from, from 1950, Five to 2003, four before the, the, the when the, gar, the war in Afghanistan really started to go awry, that 2010, you had a period where you had very few conflict. And, you know, like we had so much hope that then when the Soviet Union would collapse and the socialist world would collapse, you know, uh, it will be the end of history just to... Uh, <laughs> Para, para, uh, do a para, para, how do you say it? Uh, 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 paraphrase, paraphrase uh, a famous uh, political scientist. We'll try to invite so him to. You, you, <laughs> yes, you should, you should. And so, uh, what uh, this very quickly seemed very wrong. And actually, from 2010, the number of conflicts sort of exploded. But they were very different conflict. They were conflict about countries collapsing on themselves. They were conflict of fragility. They were, they were civil war in countries with weak institution. And you didn't have much interest anymore at that time, at the beginning at least, for the, world, for the, the US or the Russians or the Chinese to get involved. So those you know, were trying and they were very uninstitutionalized. So it was very difficult for the UN to do something. And so this has really increased from 2010 enormously. And then you had all the spring. A lot was happening in Muslim countries because you have huge problems of identity there, right? And so you had all that increasing very strongly. And uh, the, the World Bank had uh, done uh, not with the UN, but a very important report in 2011, right, which was the World Development Report, which is the annual report that the bank does on conflict security and development. And But that was done just before the big rise in conflict. So they don't talk. They talk about conflict, what you have to do, and all the new institutional economics that goes with it. But they actually don't talk about the rise in conflict. When we've been asked to write this report, the World Bank was had like about 40 countries with conflict that it had to deal with. The UN was completely overwhelmed with all the civil wars about the, and there had been a lot of thinking and study going on and, and both the World Bank and the UN, but also the OECD, all the organization that supported this, this report said, we have to take stock. Now we have to take stock about what's happening and we have to take stock about the new thinking about it uh, because we really need to start to do more on prevention because they realized very quickly. So the, the report was going to be much more on prevention uh, than just about post-conflict reconstruction and all that. So that's the, the, your two questions, I think, answered in, in, uh, in, in one answer. So building on that, um, you mentioned the WDR of 2011 on fragility, which was obviously a, you know, a seminal report on, on that topic. And we've had one of the, the lead orders, Shanta Devarajan, on the podcast before. Um, but I wanted to, to ask you kind of how the um, Pathways for Peace report and, and how you personally um, think about the the uh, the issue of fragility as related to to peace peace and conflict and and whether you think that that there is something kind of qualitatively different about countries that that are that are um, uh, you know classified as fragile um, as opposed to those who are 
you know just have have issues with conflict and uh, and so uh, and and kind of how you guys took that thinking forward with the pathways for peace report yeah so it's a it's a complex story because fragility started to be i mean the the diplomats and the politicians were talking a lot about failed states. Obviously, after the Cold War, it was clear that there were states that just had, were living from crisis to crisis, didn't have the right institution, had terrible... Uh, their problem was that they were a country that just couldn't implement economic policies. And so the World Bank engaged with a program that was called Low Income Country Under Stress. And that was really what started the work after on fragility. They were not called fragile or failed, but they were countries that were low income and that were stuck, like Central African Republic, like uh, the Solomon Island, like, uh, you know, there was a lot of those countries there stuck into a situation of really very poor governance, very poor. But the main focus was not on conflict. The main focus was about why do these countries cannot get better governance, right? Why they cannot get more political pacts that allow policies to be implemented. And then there was another dimension that was added to that because the World Bank, the UN, had a lot of work to do with conflict. And actually, by the way, the UN never liked the, the idea of fragility but they understood very well the idea of conflict. So they, uh, they started to say, okay, let's put also the conflict into that. But then the only thing we had was a correlation, a correlation that was telling us that the countries with very weak governance indicators, because the low country under stress where the poor, uh, the, the low country uh, under stress were actually, uh, low income country under stress were actually countries that had very bad indicators of governance, which is capacity to do your political economy, uh, uh, accountability, uh, corruption, uh, and all those indicators. Uh, that there was a correlation with conflict. About 90% of them where actually had some form of violent conflict. If it was not violent conflict, it was actually just violence, like gang violence in IT or gang violence in, uh, in... So there was obviously a connection between the two, but it was never very well articulated because you had also countries that were pretty solid that suddenly had uh, in one of their region, and that's the sub-regional conflict issue, had actually country going into conflict. Like Philippines was a country with relatively solid institution, but the Mindanao region was just uh, under permanent conflict. So they, they were added to that without having a good theory about one going with the others. And uh, I think uh, that, was, uh, that was an issue, but then we started to provide ammunition to that. And one central piece of that was in the World Development Report of 2011 was the role of institution. That if you don't have institutions that work, conflict will not be managed and they will become violent. So through the angle of institution, I think there was a, a good connection between uh, governance fragility, state fragility, and actual conflict. So that's the way it evolved. So what is fragility then? And you, just, you mentioned sort of the, the resistance to the concept of fragility. And if we look out there, there's so many ways to interpret it and many working definition, operational definitions from different institutions. But to you, what is fragility? So that, this is a very interesting question because we never put our hands very precisely. You don't, do, you don't, we, there was a lot of attempt for an institution that is very quantitative, like all the development bank institution, the World Bank and others, to put a line. This country is fragile, this country is not fragile. And because there was more and more interest to put quite a lot of money in fragility, 
to start to help those countries, we needed to put a line. We just could not be in between. But I was always from the, 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 the point of view that even if you put a line, you should not, the approach should not be just defined for, for some country. You need to put a line because there are resources that you have to attribute and you know what countries can get the resource and what countries cannot. But in terms of your approach, the process, you should not put a line. First of all, because there are countries that are going down into fragility, you can see it, but the indicators are not yet at a level that, that would allow to pass the threshold. Uh, but also because there are countries with regional fragility, so their national indicators are not bad, but some of their region are extremely fragile. So you had all those problems that were very complicated to define. I don't like the idea of a line of fragility, but then what is fragility? So fragility uh, was first by the bank seen as a very governance issue, as I was mentioning. But you know, the OECD slowly, where there was much more of freedom to think because there was a lot of, at the OECD, there's a lot of bilateral government of uh, a representative of rich country. And some bilateral have actually much more freedom to think uh, politically or in other ways than, than an institution like the World Bank or even than, than the UN. So they started to say, well, there's political issues in many of those countries. Uh, there are other type of issue. And what is very interesting is the, in 2015, the OECD, uh, who was monitoring, OECD was monitoring fragility and had a, st uh, a report on fragile state. In 2015, it's a very important uh, change, conceptual change. They moved the title of their report from fragile state report to state of fragility report. Now, this means that it's not, there's not a fragile state and a, and a non-fragile state. There are different state of fragility. And in the state of fragility, what you have is you have very different dimension. So they had five big dimensions, right? The economic dimension, the security dimension, the environmental dimension, the human security dimension. So they had the societal dimension, the political dimension. They had five big dimensions. And inside those dimensions, they had a number of indicators. And they didn't want to have a list anymore of fragile countries. They were putting all their country and judging them along this list, which means that uh, along those indicators, which means that you had level of fragility and not anymore, uh, 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 you know, which means that, of course, they had the bank had about 30 countries on their list. They had about 52 because you had a lot of countries that they were monitoring that were, that were not there because they were very strong on one dimension, but not on another. So that's, I think, the way we started to think about fragility. And fragility in some ways is like, you know, if, if you're depressed as a, as a person, you know, you're, you're depressed and you, you feel that things are not going, that you're not managing to get things uh, uh, straightened out. And you have countries that are collectively in this type of situation. And they don't always know uh, what's the, the cause, as we don't always know what's the real cause of our depression. And those countries have problems that might be uh, at level of the cohesion, at the level of the of the um, politics, at the level of uh, corruption, but they they are different different elements, and those elements tend very often to reinforce each other. So, in the Pathways for Peace report, and, and as you're speaking now, you know you mentioned these these elements, these actors, institutions. So. I wanted to drive, uh, dive a little bit more into that. Um, what would you say, you know, there is, there is a model with, with actors, institutions and structural factors in, in the Pathways for Peace report. Could you, could you speak a bit more to how they kind of shape and, as you say, reinforce each other, both positively out of conflict and as well as negatively into conflict um, and how that may relate to, to fragility and how you were thinking about that? So, you know, we worked very closely. I think 
to all the team of the WDR on, on security, on conflict security and development was involved in our report in one way or another, in terms of advisor, in terms of uh, providing pieces and all that. They were all involved. Uh, and uh, and the, the interesting things that what the, the WDR came up when uh, institutional economics were so, so a la mode were so, you know, the, the, which was very important. So, you know, everybody at the bank was uh, reading uh, Douglas North, or at least everybody who was working on the analytical side. And he was invited. And there was all this idea about, yeah, institution, culture, and all that. And it's, it's indeed, that was the strength of the WDR. The WDR, for the first time, put the question of quality of institution right in the middle of, of, of thinking about conflict and fragility and seeing it, the linkage between fragility and conflict. That was very, very powerful. And, you know, as every WDR, they had all the indicators, all the sort of elements. Uh, some was very interesting, like they said, well, to get out of fragility, you know, we have to look at how country did it. And they did this graph that, that is quite famous, where you see that countries that have improved, for example, on corruption took on average 25 years. Country that have improved on trust of citizens took 35 years. But that was a big eye opening, you know, and, and the one that were the most scared about that were the diplomats, because they said, what, what do we do with that, right? Well, guys, you have to stay there for 25 years, not for six months or, or two weeks, right? So, so this was this idea that once you are stuck into these things, it takes a very long time to change. Now, what did we say with our report? We said, yes, that's very fundamental. Institutions are very fundamental. By putting institutions so centrally, we sort of forgot two things that were actually much more in the old thinking about conflict. One is uh, the structures. So, you know, in the structures, I would put the things you cannot really easily change. One is history. Another one is your geography. So, you know, uh, if you are close to Russia and you are part of a place where you had a lot of Russian involved for many years, I'm sure you're not, you're not uh, understanding my example now. Uh, and then you have uh, a number of historical, very complex, mixed historica, you're going to have a structural factor that is going to be determinant in any risk of, of conflict, right? It's a structural factor. It's a history. You, you don't change it. You, you try to uh, desperately to interpret it in one way or another, but you cannot change it. The facts are there. It happened 2,000 years, we don't yet have a capacity to change what happened 2,000 years ago, uh, or 1,000 years ago, in this case, more, more uh, specifically. Now, those structural factors are very important. We have to look at it because it tells you the possibilities of what you can do. You cannot change them, but you have to really understand them much better uh, and not forget everything about by institutions, right? Uh, but uh, when you do institution, not forget everything about those other factors. And then the one that I thought was the most, uh, 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 not innovative, but the most important to reinsert into the thinking was the one of actors. Especially because today you're in a world where I think a lot of institutions are, are, are weakening. So, you know, before actors were constrained by institution. So an institution is, you need a lot of factors to come together and accept the rule of the game set by the institution. But today there's more and more problem in doing that because a lot of institutions like the UNs, others, which are actually organizations like institutions are broader, tend to uh, not uh, be as powerful to constrain actors as before. And you have actors, actors that, come together and can change things very strongly. And we need to act on those actors. Now the diplomats are much more happy because they believe that 
you know, the actors is the one we can try to convince and work with them and, 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 and build on the actors. The problem is that today, it's not only the, the president of the Republic that is an actor, is the association of uh, former soldiers of I don't know what, uh, the uh, association of, uh, of groups uh, representing this ethnic minority, and, and these are institutions, but there are actors there. And also the, the incredible powerful role that some people can think. You know, there's all this debate now. I mean, would the conflict be very different if it was not Putin who was found by, by Yeltsin in 2012? And there's a big conflict about that. I would say yes and no. Putin was actually, a lot of writing tells you that Putin was actually very much reflecting some of the current of Russian society and knew extremely well to build the right narrative to push them together and pull them together. But you can imagine that if somebody else with much more interest into the economy and much more skill into the economy would have taken it, maybe uh, this person would have seen the capacity to uh, make Russia great for their economic development. Which, which, uh, which I think uh, very quickly Putin sort of put on the side. So the actors, the people count very, very much. A and, and that's what we wanted to bring back into the model where we say, you know, there's the structure, there's the actor, the institution. These are the, the three elements that you have to have on your radar screen when you try to do more preventive work. Alessandro, you have um, the actors, you have other also um, parts of the, of the core concepts like the arenas, which we'll talk about. But I wanted to ask you, you mentioned this sort of tension between actors and structures. And ultimately, to build on your um, sort of analogy with psychology, you cannot change adverse events in your life that have happened in the past, but you could change your attitude towards them and therefore reinterpret it in, in, in a new way, in a way that you can live with them and even grow from them. So that is where leadership and actors have a chance to look at structures and to acknowledge that they're there, but then try to steer a bit the, uh, the movement, sort of the, the, the moment in a different direction. Um, what's needed for that in your view? Well, the, 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 problem, the problem with that is that... Uh, you want, you want to act very early. I mean, this is the whole problem of prevention, and we will go back when we talk about the arena and all that. On many conflicts, uh, 10 years before the conflict starts, it's very often already too late. Uh, because you have those ingredients of conflict that have built, especially with civil wars, right? to have built in and, 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 and built up. And then between those last 10 years or five years, it's, it's already extremely difficult to go back. But politically, it's very different, difficult in a country that goes well, where you want to do trade agreement and all that to say, oh, that's not going really well. I want, I'm going to stop all my uh, support to this country, all my investments. You cannot do that either because you're just going to accelerate everything, right? So the, the, the problem you have is you have uh, structural factors that are sometimes the, the weak point, I would say, the, the, the fracture in a country, right? So, for example, in the United States, you have big fracture that is racial fracture, Everybody knows that that's a very, very, you have to manage that very, very carefully because it can push to very extreme behavior, right? So you need to manage this fracture that is a fracture there, but the fracture is in big part structural. This is the history of the, the, the slavery and how the United States became to be, but you have uh, actors that have done a lot, like Martin Luther King and others, to try to change something that seems to be very difficult to change and manage to turn the population around, right? So those two actors are, are very important. The problem that I see in that, playing the actors and the structural, is very difficult to do it from outside. So for an organization like the UN, the World Bank, diplomats, it's very difficult. It's, it's, you have to have the country wanting to do it. 
you know, and again, I always like to come back to the psychological elements, right? To resolve a, 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 a crisis of anxiety you have, it's very, very, you need the people outside, but it's very difficult to accept to go and talk about that with, with, with others, right? So it's very difficult. Uh, you have to have a willingness to change it from the countryside, and it's not often that you have this sort of acceptance, especially from the government, but also from other members of society. So you prefer to close your eyes for some times, and then after that, it's a bit too late. Uh, and you see that in many conflicts, you know. Uh, you know, they have another conflict, which is the, the Ethiopia conflict. You know, when you could see Abi arriving at power, you knew that there was going a problem with the Tigrayan. Because the whole story of Ethiopia since Mengis II was about how the Tigrayan have taken on Ethiopia at the beginning for the best and at the end for the worst. And, and you knew that once someone who didn't, was not part of that would take power, an actor, he's going to have to deal with those structural problems in an extremely complicated way. And... and, and there was, uh, we'll go back to, the, to this idea of pathways, but there was a pathways to peace. There was a pathway to, and, and at, at, at some point, the pathways to peace just couldn't work and it moved into the conflict, right? And, and so this is, this, is, this is very complex. I don't think we have, we, we know how to do it, but I think we know that it has to take time and that you have to see the problem very much in advance. Sometimes it could also be sort of choosing which structure as an actor you focus on, because you mentioned one structure in the United States that obviously had very detrimental um, effects on the social cohesion. But there's also this huge tradition of individual worth of dignity that applies to everyone in this country. And ultimately, those actors who made the difference appealed to that kind of common sense of individual worth. Yes, yes. So then here you bring... Uh, you bring uh, all the new notion that is extremely important is this perception of dignity. And this perception of dignity is extremely uh, uh, important in the way a grievance built up. And it's uh, your position in society is the way other treating you is, uh, it's complicated to know what dignity is. But there's a lot of work that have shown that when collective dignity is being attacked, that's where you have the most problematic issue. That's where the grievances are building up very, very, very strongly. So as a group, you see that your own dignity has been uh, put into question. But in the terms, dignity for me was always a bit difficult to, un, un, to open it and, and understand what's in there. Uh, you know, it's, it, again, it's, it's very seen as an individual characteristics. When you put to group characteristics, it, it becomes very complicated to try to understand what's in there. But it's a determinant aspect of, of conflict today. So I think the dignity dimension, you're right to bring it up. It's really important. I wanted to follow up on something else you just mentioned, um, which is this local ownership. Um, and I love the parallels with, uh, with psychology and, um, and how you have to, to own kind of your issues and be willing to, to work with them. Um, and I think a lot of examples of, as you said, uh, solutions that are, that are supplied by external actors or policies that are implemented by external actors that don't work. But yet it is so difficult to, to, uh, to find and, and sort of um, help catalyze, if you will, that, that local ownership uh, because of various factors that are structural, institutional, political economy that drives and creates incentives for, for actors locally to not own what might be better uh, in the longer term. So how do you think of the task when it, when it, uh, as it relates to the task of external actors to support and protect and maybe even nurture local reformers that can be uh, those voices of change, the, the Martin Luther Kings, if you will, uh, of, of conflict-affected uh, countries? So, you know, we, we are uh, development ed, and especially today in a world where 
uh, there's big ideological difference and people are very much into this uh, conservative, liberal. Uh, it's, it's becoming very, there's very little compromise on things. Development ad, it, we have to say the truth, development ad has become sometimes and is perceived by the people as a way to impose a certain ideological model on countries. And, you know, who can say that it's bad to put the priority on clinic for women in the center of Afghanistan, but don't have clinic for men, really? That's a, an ideological element. I'm, I'm 100% for it. But look how it's perceived from an extremely traditional society. Uh, you have to be much more sensitive of that. I think Afghanistan was a huge, a huge demonstration of how overwhelming a country with aid and security and, and uh, creates actually its own uh, uh, collapse, uh, because that's really what has happened. So when you have money and NGOs and group that will decide everything or work with villagers on deciding everything for each villagers, just, just that does not work anymore, especially because in, in, in a period in the world where you have a huge con con confrontation between liberal ideas and much more conservative ideas. And, and uh, you 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 put your own, and I understand why you do it, but you put your own vision. I remember traveling in, in DRC and in very, very remote place in DRC. And each time you were stopping, you were finding a small clinic for raped women. So that was great. If women get raped, they can go there. But there was nothing in the normal clinic. There was nothing in uh, other place because the NGO had money to do a lot of clinic for rape there. So what is the message when you arrive in a country and the only place where you can get, get care is for women who are raped? This is, had immediately the exactly opposite effect. More women were raped and more, and it was seen like a like an attack on the way those people were behaving and all that. So you have to do things with extreme respect for what is happening and accepting. If you, if you don't like the situation, you have to accept that it's going to uh, uh, take time. In Afghanistan also, we really, uh, for some time, took the most corrupt uh, governors because they were pro-Western and imposed them on the population. And, and, you know, people are not interested to see if a governor is Western or not. On everyday basis, they want to make sure they pay less, uh, you know, for justice. They don't have pay, to pay money. Whether this is good because then girls can go to school also and all that. It, it, it just does not make sense, all these things. So our, our ad, especially in Very Risky, is too ideologically charged, first thing. And the second thing is that we need to be very careful. I think uh, the French, uh, uh, which are not doing things great either, but I think they, they've learned from Afghanistan and they have been much, much more careful with what they're doing and how they were engaging to Mali. And especially they start to disengage when they saw that the situation was very difficult and say, okay, we'll see what happened there. But we are on the way to Afghanistan and we don't want to be caught uh, in this type of uh, uh, ultimate days where we're... So we're going to go uh, earlier. And then, of course, the situation became very, very bad. So I think there's only... That, that, that's the big problem. I think there's only part of the problem that foreign aid can, can help addressing, right? And after that, you know, there were always... Uh, the, the African Union had very interesting things of peer-to-peer -peer discussion, getting somebody from another African country to go there, sending sort of uh, wise elders in countries. I really believe in those type of things. I really believe in those type of things to try to make things change slowly. But we want to do a revolution too quickly uh, through our ad, even in countries that are extremely fractured. So we have to be very careful about that. So... First, I want to comment on 
on the notion of dignity, I share the difficulty in, in defining that. And one, as you were talking, I was thinking with the, the example from the RC regarding the rape clinics, the clinics for raped women. If I was a member of that society and that's all I saw coming from the outside, I would feel an attack on my sense of worth if if I'm a man or if I'm, you know, the, the rest of society that's not that small slice of uh, of women that have gone through a terrible uh, event and do need our help, but maybe we can help them without actually undermining the sense of worth of the rest of the members of society. So, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, this is just what came to my mind. But then that also made me, we've been talking about conflict here. We've been talking about fragility, but the the other side, the desired state is that of peace. And it's, we seem to have forgotten collectively across many countries and especially in the West, why is peace desirable? And the fact that the whole UN system was started so that we stop having devastating violent conflict across the world. And maybe maybe we're too far removed from that event. What, you know, why is peace desirable and how can we better remember that? It's a very interesting uh, question. Um, I, I remember very well when we were brainstorming on one of the uh, one of the, the book we prepared about 10 years ago, which was called The, the, the Societal Dynamic of Fragility, uh, which looked at the societal aspects uh, with fragility. And there was one of the experts here who said, but you know, when you look back, the biggest progress in humanity followed war. It's, uh, you know, you can have, Hundreds of examples, right? Now people are rediscovering because you, like everybody, you know, you read a lot on Russia now and a lot on, on Ukraine now. And, and uh, you know, there's this old question whether the Mongol invasion, what did the Mongol invasion did for Russia? And there's a lot of things that they said the Mon Mongol organization gave the sense of a state structured because Mongols were... Uh, raping and destroying, but they were also organizing structure of government that were very uh, centralized and effective. And so that's how was learned the sort of ability to then govern on, 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 bigger, on bigger territory. Uh, you know, the Westphalian uh, agreement that recognized the, the legitimacy of a state came from the, after the, the war of 30 years, the, you know, the, the most... Uh, elaborate system of multilateral uh, agreements and all that was born after the Second World War. That, that is true, that even culturally and everybody was accepting that war was very important until the age of the Enlightenment, right? Where people started to say, wait a minute, uh, you know, maybe we can do things without trying to kill ourselves because before the military was the most prestigious uh, uh, person in a society and, and still is in some, uh, some, some extent. So, so the, the, this idea that let's try to get a, a world that evolves without war does not come as an easy thing, right? If you look at 2,000 years of history, uh, and that's how evolution will be made without war. For that, you need extremely strong institution and a real willingness of people to put some of their in worst instinct aside uh, and try to see that. So the, the really interesting things, and, and we talked uh, before about that, is the work, for example, of Steven Pinker onto that, uh, who wrote uh, about uh, the better angels of our nature, right? This work look at the attitude to war over 2,000 years and at what war did for humanity at 2,000 years. It's really interesting because when you think about war, you think about the Second World War. That was the worst possible time at of all time. No one had sent an atomic bomb before. No one had uh, put people in gas chamber before. That was the worst of the worst. And probably in terms of this, this humanity, it was the worst of the worst. But he said, if you take on 2,000 years 
actually, overall, you had a progress. Overall, humanity over those 2,000 years have worked themselves to try to avoid more and more war. And if you took the long term in comparison to the population of the time, so you will see, for example, that in, compar in comparison to the uh, uh, population of the Middle Age, the, uh, the invasion of the Mongols was a huge disaster, but actually it was less maybe of a disaster than the, the Second World War, but it was still a huge disaster in terms of what was happening because they, they maybe killed less people, but they were much less people. So they killed a much bigger proportion of the population that was there at that time. So this tells you that there was a huge effort over time through institution and all that for humanity to try to look at how to resolve the problem with peace. Because, because you don't want to have lives lost. You don't want to have, uh, you know, you want to have... Uh, uh, to be able to invest, you have to make sure things are not going to be destroyed. You want predictability. You want all those things that that war destroys to make progress. But the war was a great way in the past to uh, get, uh, you know, uh, a, a leveling field so that you can rebuild new institution. And you also get everybody wanting that suddenly because the war was so horrible. So you have suddenly everybody accepting that you have to move forward. It's also the case, though, that historically um, wars also help craft nations in a way. And and I, I don't I don't know who who said it that you know the state made war and war made the state. Um, but I wanted to as, as you was talking, I thought of your earlier example of, of justifying the development intervention in Central African Republic because of the role of land disputes. And as you mentioned in the report, um, land and natural resource resource management is one of the is one of the arenas, the four arenas of what people fight about. Um, can you walk us through the others a bit? Yes. Yes. So uh this idea of arena, that's one thing I'm, I'm most proud that what we come together on the Pathway for Peace uh, report. I think it's a really interesting, um, interesting uh, uh, way to try to understand the prevention of conflict. Is that at the very start, conflicts start usually in certain arenas and then it develops and then can go all over. It's a bit like a cancer, right? So it start, the, the problem starts somewhere and that's where things start to go. And then when this is not resolved, it start to spill over to the politics, to other things and, and, and other places. When we uh, prepare the work uh, with the arena, uh, we've tried to do a big inventory of conflict by putting the different dimension of those arena and try to see what is the content of a certain conflict. Does it have the land? Does it have uh, the other? Or does it have security and governance? Does it have the politics? So uh, the, the, we started to rate conflict and it was really, really interesting, for example, to see that more than 70% of, of modern conflict has a land dimension. You would not think that because you think that land are resolved somewhere else, but because there are civil wars and all that, there's very strong land dimension. But it gave rise to so many discussions that we dis dis decided at the end not to put those numbers into the report. And I was very sorry about that, but they were maybe not sufficiently. We would have need another two years of research on that to really be able to confirm it. What I'm sure is that it gives us the discovery that, wow, if we were just focusing on land much more, maybe we would resolve many, many of those conflicts uh, because uh, if on time you resolve land. And, and, um, and so uh, those, those arena are the place that you have to look at at the very origin and where you start to see the problem. So you see the, the conflict of Mali now and you see where the most... Uh, uh, Ter uh, I would say uh, lethal um, uh, terrorist groups are operating. 
and you realize that under that, there's a very strong land conflict. So the conflict is with the Fulani, the poor Fulani, who are the herders in the northern Mali, who lost a lot of, uh, to, to climate change and all that. They lost a lot of their uh, cows and, 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 and uh, livestock. And uh, they started to have more and more conflict with the agriculturists because they had to pull their, their uh, cattle much more uh, uh, to the south of the country where you had much more agricultural land. And that's really started this big conflict between uh, uh, Fulani and, and agriculturalists. And now you have one of the most uh, powerful terrorist organization in Mali that attracts a lot of the young Fulanis that, were, uh, that had this real feeling that they were really oppressed by the by the by the others and it, it was not an easy thing to say to the credit of the world bank they had very early on massive livestock programs in all this area of the country to try and 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 manage that but it was probably not enough or enough enough so that the conflict does not get even worse but that was a uh, if you look at the conflict of Mali today and you look at jihadism and terrorism and all that, you very, very quickly forget about this arena. It is actually the central arena of where the, 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 the materiality of the conflict is happening, this conflict between people who don't have a livelihood anymore, right? The second arena that is, was very strong and the one that is the most uncomfortable to talk for a development organization, and that's where we had the, the UN to hide uh, behind, which was very, very convenient, was the politics. So, and that comes to horizontal inequality and all that. The fact that politics in Mali, for example, contrary to Niger, was always seen as relatively exclusive of certain ethnicity. And that people were not feeling that they had, especially the Tuaregs or the others, were not feeling that uh, they had a real role to play into that. And so you had this element of how representative politics is, how inclusive is it, that has nothing to do with the quality of service delivery to the people. It's just people see themselves in the representation, you know, uh, like the Democrats here in the United States have understood that very, very well, that people, even if they don't see the black population will not see their uh, situation improve, if they see more of black people at central place in the administration, it will give you a sense that you're actually included. And, and that's extremely important everywhere. And Niger had the Tuareg prime minister for many years, though the, the, the Tuareg were only representing, I don't know, remember exactly, but about 15% of the population. And the Malian said for very long, never, because those guys are just, they don't, they don't represent much. So we have to have, you know, people who are really representative. Well, this type of things are exactly what the Politica Arena is. And it's very, uh, it's very, internal, right? And then we have, we have other uh, arena, the security and governance arena is really, really important because in countries like that, uh, security is fundamental. If you ask people, what do they want? Do they want school, education, health? What they want is to be, to be able to move in the street securely. That's in countries where you have a lot of insecurity that comes very often first in the, uh, so, you know, when you arrive at the World Bank, say, okay, you have to have better health service, better education service. And what about if my girl is get rapes on going to school uh, every two days, right? And what about if I have to pay uh, so much to the police to get to the health center before? And how much? So security and the governance of security and justice, absolutely fundamental. And that's what people want before they want better health, better education. Now, you can only understand how those arena works by an in-depth analysis. That's why we created at the, at the bank the, the risk and resilience analysis, which was really an analysis of those dimension of fragility and conflict risk that now was actually picked up at most of, of the institution in the world. And this is about trying to uh, uh, nail down those type of things. Because this is also things where 
a lot of people, you know, and, and we, uh, with uh, Paul and others, we tried to push a lot for the bank to look at security much more seriously because security is so fundamental. But that was a, that was a very big battle, a very difficult because we were born with this idea that we don't touch security because we're a development organization. Uh, development without security is not development. So this is this has always been funny for me because you cannot do economic development, you cannot build a bridge if it gets blown up the next day by the rebels or by whatever whatever group. And if you don't have a justice system, you can't start a company. You can't feel like you can have property rights. So all those things that matter to us economists are zero um, if you don't have the security in place. So I was thinking, um, so we, those are the, the things we fight over or about or have conflict about, the, the, the arenas you just laid out. But then can you connect for us? How do the, the, the three elements, the actors, the structural factors, and the institutions interact in those arenas? And um, which one holds the power, let's say, or which one is key to the success? I think they all they all intervene sometimes in different fashion, but in different ways, in different arenas. But what was the whole message of the report is that once you've distinguished an arena, you have to see exactly, you have to apply this model to see who's really the what's playing out, right? So to take the, the, the issue of land, for example, that is really, really important, you have a structural factor, which is that you have in Northern Sahel, if you look at Mali, my example of Mali, in Northern Sahel, you have a structural situation where climate change is making the, the, the land more and drier and drier, that the cattle has to go to, be, to get fed more and more in the south, and that's in the south where you have the land with agriculturists. This is a structural issue that you, you can actually have a, we see it as a structural issue, but actually also by fighting climate change, you can sort of try to uh, resolve some of that. But probably that it's already too late. So you will have this move of population from the uh, central Sahel to the southern Sahel, which is already very engaged and that, you know, even if you, block the if you improve the situation this this is this is gone this this is happening now and it's it's going to be too late the the in this place so you have a structural factor that you have to understand and you have to try to address right is this problem of land use and land capacity and all that but you have also a very big aspect of institution is that you always had traditionally institutions that were pretty powerful that allowed the herders to work with the agriculturist. Because you know what? Uh, there was actually a symbiosis that was uh, uh, organized around that, is that the, the farmers also need the, the, the cow to come to fertilize their field. But they had, it had to happen at a time where it was the convenient time, right? And so things are changing. And there were a very elaborate local structure of negotiation about timing and, and things and all that. And this has, like every of those community institutions, has suffered a lot over the last 30 years. A lot have collapsed. A lot have uh, disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the elders are gone. The new people are not so inclined to spend time negotiating on those things with the with the others. So you had the problem of institution is still, and you need somehow to get the, the government back because the government needs to help now and replace those community structure that have not happened. So a lot of the projects were about establishing. Uh, those negotiating system back, but this time with facilitators of the government and, and things like that. So that you had the institution that was coming there that you needed to have, right? And then finally, you had to manage the actors because along that you had a lot of young Fulani or young agriculturists that were not too happy of their life as uh, actors, as uh, herders and all that who were becoming and really pushing the sirens of fights and, and you know, we're different and we... And, and so you had, and you had the jihadist imam and you had all that. So you had actors there 
that you needed also, and that was more for the security people or for the political people to try to manage them. So if you want this problem of, of, of land needed uh, structural factors about trying to deal with uh, climate change, needed this uh, institutional factors about the negotiating capacity for the herders, and it needed to deal with those younger people who didn't want to continue the same life, who wanted to be separated uh, from that, and who wanted to have more political uh, weight, the role of the imams who were trying to recruit those uh, young people for their own aim and all that. You had to deal with those actors also. So that's an example, I think, of how you have to bring a pretty comprehensive policies around the problem. That's a really fascinating example, and then something we can really, I think, use to uh, to think about it in a very concrete way. I wanted to pick up on what you mentioned um, as you were talking, the concept of horizontal inequality, because I think it's it's so prevalent and so uh, fundamental to these issues of of, of uh, fragility and conflict. Um, could, would you be willing to talk a little bit more about uh, horizontal inequality, how it manifests uh, uh, in, in various contexts where you worked and, and how, how to support development of solutions to that? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Francis Stewart, and, uh, who's, uh, who's basically the one who, who built up the theory based on the work of Gour and other people who were the first to understand how ethnic conflicts had their own dynamic a bit different than other, than other conflict. But she built up on that with a, with a precision, with a, she was always, always um, trying to get, uh, you know, uh, data. Uh, and now as a result, we have this incredible body of data that demonstrate really that vertical inequality, which means individual-based inequality, don't really create conflict. It creates a lot of problems. It creates depressions among people. It creates sometimes more people going to violent gangs. But it's the horizontal inequality, in other words, when uh, you can uh, connect a group belonging to the fact that you're actually, it's all your group that is actually uh, uh, in an, equal, an unequal position with the rest of the society. Uh, this whole uh, uh, element that is uh, a real predictor of conflict, actually. When this happens, it's a very strong product, uh, pre predictor of conflicts. Uh, by the way, Frances Stewart was an advisor, I think, on all the book I've worked on. So she was always brought in as an advisor on the five or six uh, study we did and books we did. Uh, the, the, th this issue um, is really important, especially now where information circulates very rapidly. People know the conditions of others very rapidly. So if anything, this, uh, this because of identity issue that has become very prevalent today, this, this idea of horizontal equality, inequality, which is really the connection between identity issues and economic issues, uh, is actually very, very powerful. So once a group starts to realize that they're really uh, being pushed out uh, in a lower situation because of structural factors uh, there, they, uh, they tend to mobilize politically, right? And that not, has nothing to do with fragility. It happens in the United States. It happens uh, uh, others. The problem is that we've been focusing a lot for the groups that are at the lower level and that believe that they should be more integrated and that can see how all the others that have the main identity characteristics suffer from the same element. That's very mobilizing. The problem is the group that believe they should be on top and that the others are progressing and that is creating huge frustration. And that also is something you have to look into very carefully. This happened, for example, with the upper class uh, in India and, uh, and the Dalit and the others that are progressing now. And you have this rigidification of the, of the upper class uh, in, uh, in India. It's uh, obviously the case of the small uh, 
a population of the whites with low education that start to see their status put into questions by uh, by uh, uh, it has a lot by the the, the black the Afro American population. You have uh, the problem with immigration has a lot of those horizontal inequality integrated into it, and so this is very difficult because it connects actually to politics of identity. So it starts with a problem that is very economic, that if it's not caught on time becomes a problem that to totally identity. And when it's identity-based, then the other becomes very quickly the evil. So they don't want you with your identity, what you are, what you have been, your history. They don't want to accept you because at their uh, equivalent. Or because of your history, those guys want to be like you but they have zero right to be like you because of this element. So when you enter into the uh, field of identity politics, it becomes extremely difficult to manage before. So what, I'm, that what we were always saying is when you start to see this inequality building up or this inequality uh, that is people start to be conscious about it, that's where you have to address it very, very rapidly, right? And sometimes it's not only a monetary inequality. That's what makes things complicated. Remember very well in the, 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 the whole debate in Mali again, in the north of Mali, you know, the, 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 the Tuaregs were saying, you know, we're just, we're just really marginalized now. We've lost our camels. We've lost our trade routes. We've lost everything. And then the, 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 the Bambara are saying, yeah, but when you do health, wealth survey, you, you see that those guys have actually more money than the people from the South. Actually, the poorest are in the South. So there's more money there. Two, two different concepts of inequality, right? One was inequality of opportunity. What they had to become is become smugglers. They had to become smugglers. They were making money with it. But by being smugglers only, they were losing a lot of what making their status, their position in the society and all that. Well, the others were saying, well, no, you have more money than us, so we don't need to do special policies to integrate you. So this, this problem of, of, of horizontal inequality is actually pretty complicated to try to deal with, right? And I remember all those, those issues about the different, why do you still need an inclusion policy for Tuareg in, in Mali as being a, a, a absolutely... Uh, quasi impossible to have a discussion on that that is not totally heated and totally, uh, uh, you know, I, I nearly was fired from, from Mali there because we put a, a report saying that the actual Tuareg had elements of, uh, in the camps and all that, they had elements of, uh, of vulnerability that, uh, that uh, uh, that the, the data that showed that the people of the South were poorer than the North were actually not explaining. And they said, you are political, you want to push those people, this is not acceptable. Uh, it, ha it didn't happen too often to me, but that's where I thought I was not going to be re-invited. So, Alexander, you just made me think about your example. You just made me think about how we do not have enough knowledge about psychology or just human behavior and human nature in general, because ultimately what you described was an inequality of dignity, not necessarily the way we measure inequality, which is economic, right? They hadn't, they had the money, but they didn't have the dignity and the sense of self-worth, just like we discussed previously. So I think we, we could keep talking and we will keep talking. I think we could keep talking for hours now. And I, I think we can, this is a good point to end, but we want to announce that this is just the first of our conversations and we are, we have enjoyed this one thoroughly and we are looking forward to the next ones where we're going to talk more about the, the seminal work that, that you did in Pathways for Peace and the idea of forging a path for peace in this kind of world we live in. And then you have some very recent work on the geopolitics of fragility that is very exciting and that, that will help us, the, the next episode in the se little series will help us transition to that kind of work and we can't wait to hear more about how Russia and China are making prevention different and more difficult in a lot of cases. So thank you so much. 
for taking the time to be with us today. We absolutely enjoyed and loved this conversation and are looking forward to our, to our future ones. Thank you very much. And to all of our listeners, thank you so much for uh, tuning into F World, the Fragility Podcast. We hope you found our conversation interesting and inspiring. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to know more about us, about F World, please visit our website, f-world.org or follow us on Twitter at F World Podcast. Thanks for listening.